Hello, everyone. Last week, uh, we, we talked about mutual exclusion requirements, followed by the hardware support um, for mutual exclusion and different hardware approaches, including enabling and disabling interrupts, as well as including machine instructions. And then we talked about um, the third met method um, to uh, provide an enforcement for mutual exclusion, especially in concurrency when we have shared resources using the support from the operating system and programming languages. Um, this can be illustrated by the usage of either semaphores, monitors, message passing. And we have also discussed a classical problem to concurrency uh, um, with uh, uh, an example for the producer and consumer problem. And we have seen how the semaphores, monitors, and even message passing can be efficiently used to enforce mutual exclusion to solve the producer consumer problem. Uh, the agenda for this week actually is um, as we talk about concurrency, uh, especially in multi threading and multitasking platforms, and we talked about two main problems that might uh, result in because we are trying to enforce mutual exclusion, so we might end up to have um, deadlock or starvation. So in today's class, we will talk about the principles of deadlock and different ways, ways that can be used to actually um, either prevent the deadlock, so we call it deadlock prevention methods, or actually to avoid the deadlock before it happens using deadlock avoidance methods, or to detect when the deadlock will happen and try to uh, prevent um, this or, give an, or at least give an alert to the operating system by detecting the chance of deadlock. This could be done by the deadlock detection method. And finally, we will talk about uh, an integrated deadlock strategy, either by using prevention, avoidance, or detection. So let's start now by defining a deadlock. So deadlock can actually be defined as the permanent blocking of a set of processes that either compete for system resources or even communicate with each other. Uh, we say that a set of processes, they are in a deadlock situation when each process in the set, so this is not about two processes now, it's about set of processes. We say that these processes are in a deadlock scenario when each process in the set is blocked awaiting an event. Typically, this event could be the freeling up of some requested resources. And this event uh, uh, can only be triggered by another blocked process in the set. We know that um, uh, deadlock is permanent because one of the events um, um, uh, is ever triggered actually. And there is no efficient solution in the general case. So unlike other problems in the concurrent process management system, there is no particular optimum solution, or like we say, this is a very effective solution to either avoid or either prevent or either um, detect the deadlock. There is no efficient way for this. So most of operating system, they invoke different strategies uh, to um, minimize the chance of deadlock occurrences. Um, but there is no efficient way to guarantee that um, the deadlock um, can be easily avoided or can be easily prevented. Now let's have uh, a good uh, illustration or like a, an efficient illustration of the deadlock situation. So all deadlocks uh, would involve conflicting needs for resources by two or more processes. A common example actually is the traffic deadlock. So in this, let's have the traffic deadlock as an example. In this figure, what we can see is a situation in which we have four cars. So car number one and a car number two and a three and a four. Um, like those four cars, they have arrived at a four way stop intersection um, at approximately, we assume they arrive at the same time because it's a concurrently, uh, it's all about concurrency. So we talk about concurrent processes. So we assume that they arrive at the same time. 
What we can see here is the four quadrants of the intersections would, would act as the resources over which control is needed. So now I'm gonna say A and a B and a C and a D are my resources. So we have four processes and we have four resources. In particular, if all the four cars wish to go straight through the intersection, the resource requirement would be as follow. Car one, would, uh, which is traveling north, would need A and B. And car two, which actually uh, traveling to the left, would need a B and a C. And then car three would need a C and a D. And finally, car four needs a D and A. The rule of the road, uh, we assume this, if I assume this is like in the, in the States, for example, is that a car at a four-way stop should defer to a car immediately to its right. Um, so this rule works if there are only two cars, two or three cars at the intersection. For example, if only the northbound and the, even the westbound cars arrive at the intersection, that means the northbound car will wait and the westbound car will proceed. However, if all four cars arrive at the same time, each will refrain from entering the intersection. This actually uh, causes a potential chance for deadlock. The deadlock is only potential, not actual, because the necessary resources are available for any of the cars to proceed. If one car eventually does proceed, it can actually cause a deadlock. However, if we assume that all cars ignore the rules, no, no, we assume, and proceed like um, cautiously, of course, into the intersection at the same time, then each car seizes one resource, that means one of those intersections, uh, but cannot proceed because the required second resource has already been seized by the other car. This is an actual deadlock. So in the first scenario, we see a chance for deadlock, but it depends on the timing and <clears throat> if the four calls will follow the rules or not. But in the second graph, we can see that actually that look has occurred because one car has proceeded and uh, the four cars, um, they have proceeded and they ignore the rules. So now a deadlock has occurred. Now let's, uh, let's uh, look at this in particular for um, the concept from processes. If we have two processes now, B, like a P and a Q, and each process needs an ex uh, exclusive access to resources A and B for a certain period of time. So the process A, it will start by acquiring, uh, the process B, it will start by acquiring resource A and then acquiring resource B and then releasing A at some point of time and then followed by the release of uh, B. Uh, while the code for process Q, it started by acquiring B and then acquiring A and then releasing B and releasing A. So the following example actually highlights on the deadlock for two processes. In particular, there is a graph that is commonly used to describe the deadlock situation, especially for two processes. This graph is called the joint process diagram. And mainly we assume we have a unit processor uh, in which there's a high chance for a deadlock. Uh, now uh, let's um, now look at um, the deadlock invol involving processes and even computing resources. In this figure, uh, we, as I said before, we're gonna use the joint process diagram, uh, which illustrate the progress of two processes uh, that are competing for two resources. Uh, on the x-axis, we, um, we are seeing the progress of process B. On the y-axis, we are uh, monitoring the progress of process Q. Each process needs exclusive use of both resources for a certain period of time. So the joint uh, progress of the two processes, uh, which can be seen by the joint process diagram, it therefore represented by a bath 
that uh, progresses from the origin into a north-easterly direction. For a uni processor system, only one process at a time may execute, and the path consists of alternating horizontal and vertical segments, such that when we see a horizontal line or horizontal segment, it is used to represent a period when B execute and Q waits, and a vertical segment representing a period when Q executes and P waits. The figure here indicates area in which both B and Q require resources. So um, if we assume that both B and Q require resource B, which is the downward lines, and both B and Q require both resources, because we assume that each process requires exclusive control of any resource, these are all forbidden regions. So you can see those regions where actually um, they might be a chance for deadlock. We call them forbidden region. It is impossible actually for any path representing the joint execution pro progress of, a of B and Q to enter these regions. However, in this figure, we can see six different execution paths. These can be summarized as follows. So let's talk about path, path number one, in which Q would acquire B and then acquire A and then would release B and then will release A. So when P uh, re <clears throat> resumes execution, it would be able to acquire both resources. So there is no deadlock with this path. On the other hand, for the second path, number two, in, <clears throat> in which uh, Q acquires B and then A and B executes and blocks on a request for A. So Q releases B and A then at this point, when B resumes execution, it would be able to acquire both resources. If you look to the third pass, number three, Q acquire B, and then P would acquire A, and at this point, the deadlock is invertible. Because as execution proceeds, Q will block on A, and P will block on B. If you look to the fourth path, B acquires A, and then Q acquires B, also the deadlock is invertible. This is because an execution, uh, when the execution proceeds, Q will block on A and B will block on B. If we look to the fifth path, B acquires A and then B, and then blocks on request for B, and then when the process B releases A and B, when Q resumes execution, it will be able to acquire both resources. For the last path, if B acquires A and then B, and then releases A and B, then when Q resumes execution, it will be able to acquire both resources. So you can see that for path is one and two, five and six, there is no problem. However, three and four will cause deadlock. So the shaded area from three and four, we call it the fatal region. in which the deadlock is invertible. So um, if, an, if uh, like any execution path entered this beta region, then the deadlock is invertible. And um, please be noted that the existence of a fatal region depends on the logic of the two processes. However, deadlock is only invertible if the joint brokers of the two processes would create a path that enters into the fatal region. 
So you can see the synchronization of um, the processing and the execution of the two processes might, might lead to different methods of execution. You have to, uh, to be careful as an operating system, how, you do, how would you synchronize the execution of these, uh, of these two processes such that no path will be created and enter into the feature region. So whether or not did lock occurs depends on both the dynamics of the execution and even on the details of the application that would need like two processes as an a and a Q in this example. So some of you actually would thought that um, regardless of the relative timing of the two processes, there is a chance for deadlock. So as an operating system management component, you should be very careful. How would you design, design the, uh, the, the execution of the processes in a way not to generate batches that might get into a deadlock? As shown in this diagram, the joint progress uh, diagram can be used to record the execution history of two processes that share this, um, the same um, resources. In case where we actually have two more, uh, two, two processes or more, uh, more than two processes uh, that uh, might compete for the same resource, at this point, we will not use a two-dimensional two joint um, progress diagram we will need a higher dimensional diagram uh, uh, to monitor or to uh, track the progress of the multiple processes. Uh, the principles concerning fatal regions and deadlock actually would remain the same even for a high dimensional um, joint progress diagram. So two general categories of resources can be defined um, or can be differentiated. The first one is called reusable resources versus consumable resources. A reusable resource is the one that can be safely used by one process at a time and is not depleted by that use. Processes obtain resource unit, <clears throat> units that they later release for reuse by other processes. Examples of reusable resources would include the processor, input output channels, the main and the secondary memory. Including devices and even data structures such as files databases, and semaphores. On the other hand, consumable resources, it, the one can, that can be created, which means we can be, can be produced, and at the same time can be destroyed or consumed. Examples of consumable resources, <clears throat> including interrupts, signals, messages, and even information in input output, <clears throat> buffers. Now let's look to an example of deadlock that would involve reusable resources. Consider two processes, a P and a Q. that compete for executive access to a disk file D. and a tape drive T. Deadlock will occur if each process holds one resource and requests the other resource. Keep in mind, the program, uh, the two programs, the P and a Q, <clears throat> um, um, they are engaged in accessing both the resources, uh, a D and a T in the following sequence for the process B. The first step, which is called P0, it will start by requesting D. And then in P1, D would be locked by process P in, process, in step P2. It will initiate a request to T and then following by locking T. And step number four in <clears throat> process B, that means uh, a certain function or a certain code will be executed. And then in the last two steps, D would be unlocked followed by 
T as well. So the set of actions for process Q start by steps Q0 until Q6. We start by requesting T and then locking T, requesting D, locking D, do some actions, and then unlock into the T and unlock to the D. This is just an example of two processes that might cause a reuse deadlock. <clears throat> for example, deadlock occurs if the multi-programming system interleaves the execution of the two processes as follows. If we start by step zero for process P, followed by step one for the same process B, and then Q0 from process Q, and then process and then step two from process P, followed by Q2 from, uh, sorry, um, B0 and then B1 and then Q0 and then Q1 and then P2 and then Q2. If we have the sequence of interleaving execution of the two processes, it may actually appear that uh, this will cause a deadlock. If you look at this sequence, it, it might be like a programming error rather than just a, pro a problem by the operating system designer. However, we have seen that concurrent program design is a challenging. Such a deadlock do occur and the code is often embedded in complex program logic, which actually making the detection of the deadlock a very difficult process. One strategy to deal with the deadlock of reusable resources um, is to impose system design constraints concerning the order in which resources can be requested. So you can see in the first two steps, a B0 and B1, the bo both um, the D has been locked. And then if we, if we consume Q0 and Q1, T has been locked. And then if you go back to the second step of um, P2, now we are requesting T, which is actually locked. And here in Q2, you are requesting D, which is actually locked. So that's where the sequence of execution of the two processes has caused a deadlock of two reusable resources. Let's now go over another example of deadlock with another shape of, or another uh, example of a, re a reusable resource which has to do with request to main memory. Now assume the space available for the location in the main memory is just 200 kilobytes. And the following sequence of request occurs. Process one requests 80 kilobytes. And then at some point it requests 60 kilobytes. And then process two requests 70 kilobytes followed by 80 kilobytes. The deadlock will occur at this point if both processes progress to their second request. If the amount of memory to be requested is not known ahead of time, it's difficult to deal with this type of deadlock by means of system design constraint. The best way to deal with this particular problem is as a matter of fact, uh, to eliminate the possibility uh, of the deadlock by using virtual memory that will help in obtaining extra space. At this point, none of the processes will be locked on the request of the memory and uh, the deadlock will be resolved. Let's go over a third example of deadlock, but not for reusable resources, now it's for consumable resources. Consider the following, um, the, the following pair of processes in which each process actually attempts to receive a message from the other process and then send a message to the other process. So process one will receive a message from process two and then send a message to process two. 
while process two receive a message from process one and then send the message to process one. Of course, this is message two and this is message one. Did lock will occur in this scenario if the receive is blocking That means the receiving process is actually blocked until the message is received. Once again, a design error is the cause of the deadlock. Such errors may be quite uh, difficult to detect. Actually, it may be, um, we, might, we might actually reach a situation that a rare combination of events has caused such a deadlock. And uh, at this point, the program uh, um, that um, initiate the send and receive operation over a considerable period of time uh, would not uh, be able to detect the deadlock efficiently because in communication uh, it channels, it's uh, especially for consumable resources, the detection for the deadlock is a very hard process. Uh, a useful tool in actually characterizing the allocation of resources to processes is the uh, resource allocation graph. So it's called the resource allocation graph. Sometimes we use abbreviation as RAG. The resource allocation graph is a directed graph. So we should have nodes and we should have our, um, the um, edges. Those edges always be directed. So there is like an arrow that shows where uh, the source and the destination in the graph, the source node and the destination node. So uh, in the directed graph, um, uh, we know that the, um, the resource allocation graph actually used to define a state of a certain system in terms of the resources and the processes that are acquiring those resources, such that with each process and um, each resource, we use a node representation. So a circle node refers to a process while a square node refers to a resource. A graph edge directed from a process to a resource indicate a resource, this resource that has been requested by the process, but not yet granted. So here we can see that we have a directed arrow from process one to resource A, R A. So process one has requested A, but A is not granted um, R A, the resource A is not granted to process one yet. Within the resource node, <clears throat> a dot is shown for each instance of that resource. So if we have one dot, means we just have one instance. If we have multiple dots, that means we have multiple instance of the resource. Examples of resource types that may have multiple instance could be uh, input output devices and that are allocated by a resource management module in the operating system. Uh, a graph edge directed from a reusable resource node dot to a process indicates a request that has been granted. So if you can see an arrow coming from the resource to the process, means this resource has been granted to this process. On other words, the process has been assigned one unit of that resource if we just have one dot. A graph edge directed from a consumable resource node dot to a process indicates that the process is actually the producer of that process, of that resource. Like in, um, in this figure, we can actually see an example of the lock. There is only one unit available from each resource. So from resource A, we just have one unit and from resource B, we just have one unit. Process um, one is requesting RA while it actually uh, has been granted uh, a resource B and process two has requested process uh, resource B, RB, while it has been actually granted, uh, has, has granted resource A. So this is a clearly circular weight for resource release. 
So a process has requested us a resource while it actually um, granting uh, another resource um, that is requested by another process. So this is a deadlock situation. If we look to the no deadlock situation, which uh, can be seen in this topology, there is no deadlock because actually we have multiple units of each resource available. So you can see even we still have a circular weight, but the solution has been solved using multiple instances of the resource. Similar to the memory example that we shared before, if we have multiple resources uh, of the memory, which is the virtual memory, the deadlock can be resolved. However, if we look to this resource allocation graph that corresponds to a deadlock situation, in this case, we don't have a simple situation in which two processes each have one resource that um, the other process would need. Rather, in this case, there is a circular chain. Of processes and resources that results in deadlock. So you can see process one is requesting resource P, while actually it is granted, uh, it has been granted resource A. At the same time, Process two is requesting C, and it has been um, granted with resource B. And then process three, it requests resource T, while it has been granted with resource C. And process four, it is requesting resource A, while it has acquired or it has been granted resource D. So you can see there's a circle chain of the requests and the processes that has resulted in a deadlock. So there are three um, conditions of policy that um, must be present for a deadlock to be possible. It could be due to mutual execution in which only one process may use a resource at a time, no, process, no other processes may access that resource unit that has been allocated to the other process, this will cause deadlock. Also the hold and wait scenario in which a process may hold allocated resources while awaiting assignment for other resources. So this is another scenario or a condition that is represented with a deadlock or no preemption. No resource can be forcibly removed from a process holding that resource. In many ways, these conditions are quite desirable. For example, in mutual execution, uh, we needed uh, to ensure consistency of results and the integrity of a certain database. Similarly, for the preemption should not be done arbitrary. For example, when a data sources are involved, a preemption um, must be supported by a rollback recovery mechanism, as an example, which restores a process and its resources to a suitable previous state from which the process can eventually repeat its actions. However, the first three conditions that will lead to a deadlock or, or result even with a deadlock, uh, they are uh, necessarily to cause deadlock, but they are not sufficient for deadlock to exist. For deadlock to actually take place, a fourth condition is required, which is the circular weight. A circular weight, as I have, I have shared with you in the previous slide, is a closed chain of processes um, that in which each process holds at least one resource needed by the next process in the chain. The fourth condition is actually a potential consequence of the first three. So if you are enforcing mutual execution and you uh, allow the hold and wait scenario, and at the same time, there is no preemptions, that will lead uh, to, um, uh, that might lead to the circular weight scenario, uh, which in which a sequence of events may occur that lead to um, an uh, unresolvable un uh, circular weight. And this unresolvable circular weight is uh, in fact the definition of the deadlock. The circle weight listed as the fourth condition 
we always call it unresolvable. So if we always have a circular weight scenario, it cannot be prevented, it cannot be avoided, it's unresolvable. Unresol because the first three conditions hold, means if we end up to have circular weight, that means we have mutual exclusion, we do have the holding weight scenario, and we do have no preemptions condition as well. Thus, the, four condi the fourth condition uh, taken all together, it constitutes a necessarily and a sufficient condition for deadlock. As I said before, there is no single e efficient strategy or way that can deal with all type of deadlocks. There is no efficient way that can actually be used to even eliminate or avoid the deadlock. But there are three approaches that are commonly used. The first one is called deadlock prevention. The second one is called deadlock avoidance. And the third one is called deadlock detection. And deadlock prevention means we try to disable one of the three necessarily conditions for deadlock, occurrences, or prevent the circular weight condition from happening. So either you are disallowing one of the three conditions or prevent the circular weight condition. In deadlock avoidance, uh, it's all about um, not granting a resource request if this allocation might lead to a deadlock. So you look to the resource granting requests, and then if the resource grant, uh, there's, if the resource, um, if you grant a resource to a process, this might lead to a deadlock. Then you will not grant such resource to a process. On the other hand, the deadlock detection method will actually grant the resource request when possible, but periodically they will check for the presence of deadlock and take action to recover. So. Um, we will examine each of these methods uh, in turn. So we will start by deadlock prevention and then deadlock avoidance and deadlock detection. After, as a matter of fact, uh, introducing some um, resource allocation graphs and uh, the deadlock conditions as we just explained. So, Let's start the first deadlock prevention strategy. The strategy of deadlock prevention is very simple, but to design a system in such a way that the possibility of deadlock is excluded is a little bit tricky. We can view deadlock prevention methods as falling into two classes, either indirect prevention method or direct prevention method. An indirect method of deadlock prevention means we try to prevent the deadlock by preventing the occurrence of one of the three necessarily conditions listed previously, which is mutual exclusion, as well as the hold and wait and the no preemption. A direct method, on the other hand, is a way of preventing a deadlock by just preventing the occurrence of the circular weight. In deadlock condition prevention, let's look about how to prevent uh, the deadlock uh, conditions. Um, if we are uh, um, designing an operating system such that it will uh, prevent the mutual exclusion, in general, mutual exclusion um, is the first of the four listed conditions, uh, which cannot be actually disabled or disallowed. If access to a resource requires mutual exclusion, then mutual exclusion must be supported by the operating system. Some resources, such as files, um, may allow multiple access for reads, uh, but not exclusive access for writes. Even in this case, a deadlock can occur if more than one process require um, write permission. On the other hand, if we would like to prevent the hold and wait or disallow, the hold and wait condition can be prevented by requiring that, um, uh, uh, actually we can prevent it by requiring that a process request all of its required resources at one time and blocking the process until all the requests can be granted simultaneously. This approach, is, approach is, as a matter of fact, is inefficient because of uh, two reasons. 
the first one, a process may, uh, may held up for a long time waiting for all of its resources requests to be uh, filled, when in fact it could be proceeded with only some of these resources. And the second reason, resources allocated to a process may remain unused for a considerable amount of time, during which, uh, during which time they are denied to other processes. And this might cause another problem that a process may not know in advance all of the resources that it, it uh, acquires. So how would you actually assign all of the resources and block every other, resource, other process on that condition? So there is also the practical problem created by the use of modular programming or even the multi-threaded structure of an application because an application would need to be aware of all the resources that would be requested at all levels or even in all modules to make the simultaneous request. So you can see it's a little bit tricky to prevent the hold and wait scenario. Uh, when it comes to the no preemption scenario, this condition can be prevented in several ways. First, if a process holding certain resources is denied a further request, that process must release its original resources and if necessarily request them again, together with the additional resources. Alternatively, alternatively, if a process requests a resource that is actually currently held by another process, the operating system may preempt the second process and require, require this process to release its resources. This later scheme would prevent it lock only if no two processes possess uh, the same priority. Uh, this approach that I just explained is practical when uh, only when applied to resources that uh, has a state that can be easily saved and restored later, as in the case with the processor. Now, for the last condition, which is the circular weight condition, um, if we would like to prevent it, um, it could be done by defining a linear order of resource types. If a process has been allocated a resource of type R, like assume we have a type R, then it may sub subsequently request one, uh, like only those resource of type following R in the order. To see that this strategy works, let, uh, let's now as, um, associate an index with each resource type. So if we assume resource I, precedes resource J. So if we have resource one and then resource two, and then resource three, maybe up to resource N. So if we have resource I and then resource J, such that resource I precedes resource uh, J in the order, if I less than J. Now suppose that two processes A and B are deadlocked because A has acquired RI. So now process A and um, requested RJ, so now A acquired RI and actually made a request to acquire RJ. On the other hand, B has acquired RJ and made a request for RI. This condition is impossible actually because it implies that I is less than J and J is less than I. So adding this um, uh, type of resources allow the resource to be numbered by an index will resolve the deadlock caused by the circle weight. So as we have seen before with the hold and weight prevention, circle weight prevention may be inefficient because it actually slows down processes and denying resources access unnecessarily. So that means deadlock prevention. Um, it's um, a way of preventing deadlocks. It may provide a good solution, but not a sufficient solution. That's why they have been, there have been some strategies to actually avoid the deadlock. Um, an approach to solving the deadlock problem that is slightly different from the deadlock prevention is called deadlock avoidance. In deadlock prevention, as we have seen before, we actually constrain the resource request to prevent at least one of the four conditions of the deadlock. This is either done indirectly or preventing one of the three necessary policy conditions um, or even done directly by uh, preventing the circle weight. 
This leads to inefficient use of even resources and inefficient execution of procedures. On the other hand, uh, deadlock prevention allows the three necessary condition, but makes a somehow like choice to assure that the deadlock point is never reached. As such, avoidance method allows um, more concurrency than prevention. With, that, with deadlock avoidance, a decision is made dynamically, whether the current resource allocation request will, if granted, potentially lead to a deadlock or not. Thus, deadlock avoidance requires knowledge of future physicists um, resource request. So keep in mind, it allows the three necessary condition, but it, it, like, it will make a choice to assure that the deadlock point is never reached. There are two approaches to deadlock avoidance. The first one is called the uh, resource allocation denial in which we do not grant an incremental resource request to a process if this allocation might lead to deadlock. On the other hand, the other approach to avoid deadlock is called um, process initiation denial means we do not start a process if it, its demands might lead to a deadlock. Let's now discuss the first method, which is the resource allocation denial. So um, to avoid the deadlock using resource allocation denial, we are using the banker's algorithm. So the banker algorithm is very efficient to avoid deadlocks especially by denying requests for resource allocation. The strategy of resource allocation denier was first introduced uh, by um, DG in 65. Now let's begin uh, by defining the concepts of uh, state and safe state because they are commonly used in the banker's algorithm to determine if a resource should be allocated or not, but based on the current state of a system. At any time, a process may have zero or more resources allocated to it. So using this notion, what is a state of a system? The state of a system reflects the current allocation um, of resources to processes. So we have resources. We would like to allocate those resources to processes. Thus, the state's condition of uh, also the state of the system will always contain two vectors. The first one is called the resource vector, as well as the available vector. In addition to two matrices, the first one is called the claim matrix. And the A matrix, the allocation matrix. So based on the state of the system, we say this state is safe. So um, in which there is at least one sequence of resource allocation to processes that doesn't actually result in a deadlock. That means all the processes can be run to completion. On the other hand, a state is said to be unsafe if it's not a safe state. So a safe state means is, is a state of a system defined by the resource vector, available vector, and the claim matrix, allocation matrix, such that we can find a sequence of execution of the processes that will not lead at least one sequence of resource allocation to processes that doesn't result in deadlock. In other words, we guarantee that this sequence of execution will allow all the processes to run to completion. Let's look to the following example that helps in identifying if a given state of a system is a safe state or not. So um, the following example illustrate the, the concepts of state and a safe state. So in this um, state, we do have four processes and uh, we have three resources. The total amount of resources for R, resource one and resource two and resource three is listed in the resource vector. 
which we use it, we, we denoted by the vector R. So now we have nine units of resource one, we have three units of resource two, and we have six units of resource three. In the current state allocation, in the current the current state allocation have been made to the four processes such that we only have one unit of uh, resource two available and one unit of resource three available. This is defined in the available vector V. As I told you before, we always have two vectors, the resource vector and the available vector. Now we're gonna denote this by vector R and vector V. And we have two matrices, the claim matrix and the allocation matrix. The claim matrix always of size number of processes times the number of resources. And also the same for A, it's the number of processes and the number of resources. This is the size of the matrix. So each one of them here is just size of four by three. This is size four by three. So the question is, is this a safe state? A safe state will always um, result to a sequence of execution of the processes um, until all the processes will, uh, uh, will, um, will execute to a completion. That means in a safe state, uh, uh, will lead to no deadlock. So if you can identify that the current state is a safe state, so that means this um, uh, will help or identifying or even uh, avoiding the deadlock by granting or not granting a resource request by processes. So you can see in the claim matrix, we list uh, the amount of resources um, requests by processes. And in the allocation matrix, we, uh, we just plot the actual allocations for each process. For example, process one has requested three units of resource one, two units of resource two, and three units of resource three, while it has been granted just one unit of resource one and nothing from resource two and nothing from resource three. On another example for process uh, four, it requests four units of resource one and two units of resource two and two units of resource three, while it has been only granted two units of resource three and nothing from one and a two. So if we can find a sequence using the current state such that all the processes will, will uh, execute until the completion and uh, none of them has caused um, a deadlock. So this is a safe state. So if we would like to identify if, if we like, would like actually to answer the question if this is um, a safe state or not, as I said before, you just need to answer the question, can any of the four processes be run to completion with the resources available? On other words, can the difference between the maximum requirement and the current allocation for any process be met with the available resources? In terms of the matrices and the vectors introduced earlier, the condition to be made actually for a given process. So if you would like, so for a given process, J, if you can guarantee that the difference between the claim and the allocation matrix, always less than the VJ, and this is for all J. So this process can, um, can, um, proceed to completion. Um, and if the process can, be, can proceed to completion, so if all the processes can, can proceed to completion, so the given state is um, a safe state, that means it's deadlock free. If it's not a safe state, so there is a chance of deadlock. So if there's a chance of deadlock, so we will not grant this a resource request. So by avoiding or like resource denial. So this is the banker's algorithm that is commonly used to grant or not grant resources. So if it's a safe state, grant the resources. If it's not a safe state, then don't grant the resources. So now let's look to see if it's a safe state or not. So uh, clearly this is, uh, let's now examine which process that can actually start uh, um, execute to completion. And then uh, based on this, we can find a, a, a sequence of other, uh, other processes that will also execute to completion. And at the end, all the processes will execute to completion. So if it's a safe state or not. So this is clearly not possible for process one because process one has requested um, actually uh, 
uh, three units of resource one and two units for resource two and two units from resource three, while we only have uh, from the previous uh, vector. If you look backward, we only have, so this is like the current, so for the current state, which we have it before, we only have from resource one and resource two and resource three, we only have a zero and a zero and one. So we cannot start by process one because it requests more than what's available. So um, uh, at this point, it may be convenient to allow um, process two to start first to completion. So uh, process two also from the previous graph, process two has requested. Um, so previously, this matrix we have like the row for process two, we have six and one and three. And the allocation for process two, if we map it, it has six and one and a two. So you can see that it only needs one more unit of resource three, and we do have it in the available vector. So that means we could grant this resource to process two, and that means process two will proceed to completion. So if process two proceed to completion and then released uh, all of its resources after the completion, we can see now process two is done. It has been granted. Now we have more available vector. So previously process two has um, six and one and uh, three. And now our available vectors uh, will be six and a two and a three, while the resource vector remains nine and a three and a six. So actually, let me correct this. The available vector from the previous slide was zero, one, and one, and one. So now we add the six and one and three from process two after process two completes its execution. So if we add them up, we will have the six, and then we have two, and the entire three was given to process two. So we give this one to process two for completion, and then we, we return, we, we accumulate it backwards. So now we have the three back. So now we have the six and a two and a three after process two runs to completion. So this is the current state of the system. The current state of a system is process two completed. Now there is no claim, there is no allocation. It, it, is, uh, um, it has been run for completion. We have more available resources, six and two and three. Now, what do you think? Which process now we assume that um, could be run next? So now process two is done. I think at this point, maybe we could go back and choose process one. So process one, if we, um, if we look now to the current state of the system, if you assume that process one runs to completion, so process one is completed and we also have process two completed. So we have always to monitor the difference between C and A and the available vector to grant the resources for uh, the processes. And then we assume that process one is completed and all the resources are accumulated back in the available vector. Now we have a seven from R1, a two from R2, and a three from R3 with the same resource vector R. So it's clearly uh, like showing now that we were able to execute process one and then process two. And as a matter of fact, it's easily now to run process three to completion. Also, and then once process three runs to completion, we put all the resources back into the available vector. So um, after process three runs to a completion, it's easy made to run process four to completion as well. And that means this state is a safe state. So um, at this point, uh, we can see that all the processes have run to completion. So this initial state that we started with uh, by the first figure is a safe state. So there is no chance of deadlock if we follow such sequence. Um, so these concepts are just uh, the, um, the, the notion of, or the strategy of deadlock avoidance, because it ensures that the system of processes and resources is always in a safe state. When a process makes a request for a set of resources, assume that the request is granted, update the system state accordingly, 
and determine if the result is a safe state or not. If it's, if it's a safe state, then grant the request. If it's not a safe state, then block the process until it's actually safe to grant the request. Because if it's not a safe state, that means we have a high chance of deadlock, which can be clearly shown in the following graph. Now consider this um, state defined in this figure, which is the initial state. We have also four processes. We have three resources. This is the claim matrix, and this is the actual allocation matrix. This is the original resource vector, and this is the only available vector for the given state. So now assume, if we assume that process two would make a request for one additional unit of R1 and one additional unit of R2, if you assume this request is granted, then the resulting state that we have seen in previous figure uh, would lead to a safe state, which is fine. But if we change this grant, this uh, resource allocation, such that if we assume now that process one would make the request of one additional unit of R1 and one additional unit of R3. So now if we assume that process one would like one additional unit of R1 and one additional unit of R3. And as a matter of fact, if we assume that the request is granted, we are left in the state that is showing the request of process one to resource one or resource three. The question is, is this a safe state? As a matter of fact, the answer for this is no, because each process will need at least one additional unit of R1 and there are none available. Thus on the basis of deadlock avoidance, the request by process one should be denied and now process one should be blocked until all the resources are completely released. As a matter of fact, it's important to point out that this is not a deadlock state that we can see in this figure. It is a, a potential for deadlock. So it is possible, for example, that if process one were run from this state, it would sub subsequently release one unit of R1 and one unit of R3 prior to needing um, uh, these resources again. So if this has actually happened, the system could return to a safe state. Thus, the idea of deadlock avoidance strategy doesn't predict deadlock with a certainty. It merely anticipates the possibility of deadlock and assure that there is a never such possibility. So as I said, it's an avoidance way. It's not guaranteed. Uh, that's why it has uh, good advantages uh, of um, uh, not necessarily to preempt and roll back processes. Uh, as exactly happened um, in uh, deadlock um, uh, detection, which we'll talk about it later. Also, it is less restrictive than deadlock prevention because in deadlock prevention, you prevent everything with the assumption that this is a solution. It's inefficient because you are uh, uh, wasting the resources and causing the processes to wait for, um, uh, it's an efficient ways of, uh, for, of consuming and executing processes. So uh, on the other hand, it has a certain number of restrictions or limitations uh, on its use because the maximum resource requirement for each process must be stated in advance. Also, the processes under consideration must be independent. Uh, on other words, the order in which they execute must be unconstrained by any synchronization requirements. Also, there must be a fixed number of resources to allocate and no process may exit when holding resources. So what we can see so far is deadlock prevention strategies are very conservative. They solve the problem of deadlock by just limiting access to resources and by imposing restriction on processes. Uh, on the opposite is extreme deadlock detection strategy. They don't limit resource access or uh, restrict process actions with deadlock detection, which is the third method of resolving deadlocks, um, we, we can see that requested resources are granted to processes whenever possible. And then periodically the operating system performs an algorithm that allows um, the operator itself to detect the circular weight condition, which we uh, describe it as a major 
uh, reason uh, that causes deadlock. So with that being said, let's now talk about the third deadlock detection algorithm that can be easily used to detect deadlock. So we're talking about prevention. We talked about avoidance by, uh, uh, by um, grand, degree, grand degree resource allocation. And the third one is deadlock detection. So in deadlock, in deadlock detection, we know that there is a check for deadlock uh, that can be made as frequently as each resource request or less frequently, depending on how likely it is for a deadlock to occur. Uh, checking uh, at each resource request has two advantages. Actually, it leads to early detection and the algorithm is relatively simple because it is based on incremental changes to the state of the system. However, on the other hand, such request checks, uh, those requests, uh, frequent, those frequent checks will consume considerable processor time. So if we look to the following figure, uh, we can see that uh, we can actually um, um, discuss the deadlock detection algorithm, which is a simple incremental algorithm of detection. Uh, how it works, we always start by marking the process that has no allocated resources. In this example, we are gonna start by process four. So process four has not been allocated any resources. So process four will not actually cause in any deadlock. So we're gonna mark it. And then we're gonna set a, a, a vector, which we're gonna call it the allocation vector. In this case, um, I'm gonna assume it, um, uh, you could call it A, I'm gonna call A vector equals to the zero and one. And then uh, we look to the request of the processes that are less than or equal to the A. So which process here would have, um, um, that would request um, um, resources such that uh, it's less than or equal to um, A. So this is clearly process three. So process three just need one resource of resource five. So that means we will mark now process three will run to completion because process three um, can be easily granted those resources. So process three will be marked. And that means the allocation vector now will be the old allocation vector plus what has been granted. So now if we would like to grant this to process three, so this is a zero and a zero and a zero and a one and a zero plus the old A, which was a zero and a zero and a zero, a zero and a one. So if we add them, them up, so we have a new A vector, which is three zeros and one from resource four and one from resource five. Keep in mind that originally process three uh, was uh, actually granted um, one unit of resource four, while it needs one unit from resource five. So now we have consumed one unit from resource four another one unit from resource five. So this is the current allocation vector. So, or um, once process three and process uh, four have been marked and we have the current allocation uh, vector, if uh, we can see that uh, no other unmarked processes uh, would have a row in the matrix Q uh, that is less than or equal to A. So do we see in other matrix? So this is the new A, A vector, which is allocation vector because uh, process four needs nothing, so it's marked. Process three, we were able to run into execution. So originally it, need, it has been allocated one unit of four and then um, one unit of five. So this is the new resources available and we don't see any other row in, um, um, in the Q matrix that, uh, that will be less than or equal to A. So because we don't see any other row at this method, at this point, the detection algorithm will stop and say, this is marked, this is marked, this is unmarked, this is unmarked. So the, the algorithm would conclude that P1 and P2, process one and P2, they are unmarked. That means we haven't uh, gone to a situation where um, the two processes can run to completion. So a conclusion would be P1 and P2 would uh, lead uh, to deadlock. So this is the idea of the incremental usage uh, of the detection algorithm. We always start by the process that has no allocation resources. 
and then uh, we look to the second uh, and when we mark it. And then we look to the second process in the Q matrix such that it has a row less than or equal to the allocation vector. If yes, the only thing we would do is we're going to sum um, whatever given in the allocation matrix uh, and uh, whatever is in the allocation vector. And then that would be the new allocation vector. And we keep incrementally looking into the Q matrix. If we can find another row that has a value less than or equal to the allocation vector, we will mark this process to completion. Otherwise, we will stop. And once we stop, we will determine which processes are um, unmarked. These processes will lead to a deadlock. So we can detect that a deadlock might be caused by these two processes. This is the detection algorithm. So once that lock has been detected, some strategies are needed for recovery. Um, the following are considered as possible approaches. Uh, actually, they are listed in the order of increasing sophistication. So one way of recovery is to apport all the deadlock procedures. And uh, actually, believe it or not, it is one of the most common, if not the most common, um, um, if it's actually not the most common solution adopted in operating systems is apport all the deadlock procedures. So once you detect that process one and process two, they are a cause of deadlock, you will apport it. Another strategy is to back up each deadlock process to some previously defined checkpoint and restart all the processes. But this would require that rollback and restart mechanism to be built into the system. And as a matter of fact, the risk in this approach is that the original deadlock may reoccur. However, the non-determinacy of concurrent processing uh, may ensure that this is not the case or will not happen. A third strategy to recover from a deadlock detection um, or um, to recover to to uh, to provide a recovery a recovery strategy based on the detecting deadlock is to successfully abort uh, deadlock processes until deadlock no longer exists. Uh, the order in which processes are selected for apportion uh, should be on the basis of some criteria or of minimum cost um, uh, and, of course, uh, eff efficient use of the processor. At each apportion, the detection algorithm must be re-invoked to see whether the deadlock still exists or not. So that means incrementally, you will invoke the detection algorithm once you apport one process at a time. The fourth strategy is successfully preempt resources until the lock no longer exists. Um, as we can see in the third condition, there is a cost-based selection should be used and reinvocation of the detection algorithm is required after each preemptor. Pre um, a process that has been a resource um, preempted from, it must be rolled back to a point prior to its acquisition of that resource. As a matter of fact, for the third strategy and the fourth strategy, uh, the, the selection criteria could be one of the following. It could, uh, you could choose the process with the least amount of processor time consumed so far, or the least amount of output produced so far, or the process with the most estimated time remaining, or even the process with the least total resources allocated so far, or the process with the lowest priority. Um, actually, some of these quantities are easier to measure than others. Uh, for example, estimated time remaining is particularly suspected uh, and estimated. Uh, also, other than the means of priority measure, there is no indication of the cost to the user as opposed to the cost of a system as a whole. So it's a little bit tricky to quantify those numbers, but. Um, it could be chosen based on any of those criteria. So there are some strengths and weakness um, to all of the strategies for dealing with deadlock. Rather than attempting to design an operating system facility that employs uh, only one of these strategies, it might be more efficient to use different strategies in different situations. So um, some uh, recommendations is uh, to group resources into a number of different resource uh, classes. 
or to use the linear ordering strategy defined previously, which I told you assign uh, an index for each resource such that they should be requested in order. This could be uh, uh, used for preventing circular weight um, and in return would prevent the deadlock between, between resource classes. Also within um, a resource class, you might wanna use the algorithm that is most appropriate for that class. As an example of this technique, you might wanna consider um, either swappable classes, um, swappable space that is um, mainly based on the classes of resources. It could be blocks of memory on secondary storage for use in swapping processes, or it could be um, process resources like assignable devices, uh, such as deep uh, drivers and files, or it could be the main memory itself. Um, uh, it could be assignable to processes in pages or even segments. And it could be internal resources like input output a channel. So you may wanna define classes of resources. It could be swap of space, it could be process resource, or it could be main memory, it could be internal resources. And then you use the algorithm that is most efficient for that class. You may wanna use um, prevention for swappable spaces, or you may wanna use detection for process resources, or you may, you may wanna to use avoidance for the memory, main memory. So uh, a strategy, which we call it integrated deadlock strategy is to combine what we have learned among all the uh, different strategies for deadlock um, in general, whether it's uh, avoidance or prevention or detection, you, uh, you could combine what we have learned in all of these strategies to come up with uh, an integrated strategy uh, to handle deadlocks. A way in this is on, uh, to identify res uh, your resources into classes and use the proper algorithm uh, for each class. So the order of the preceding list um, that I showed to you, like uh, which one, is it swappable space, is it process uh, uh, resources, main memory, internal resources, like how would um, uh, uh, assign resources? So within each class, uh, the following strategy could be used. For swappable space, um, prevention of deadlock could be um, could be provided or could be completed by requiring that by requiring that all of the required resources that may be used um, uh, may be used um, and actually allocated at one time, as we have seen in the hold and wait prevention strategy. Um, we could actually um, apply this um, prevention method in swappable space uh, resources because it's reasonable. Uh, if and only if, if the maximum storage requirement is actually known. So you can see a uh, one way of uh, listing or like uh, order the preceding uh, list of resources based, based on which methods for swappable uh, space, maybe prevention is a good strategy. For process resources, avoidance might be a good option. Avoidance will often be effective in this category because it's reasonable to expect processes to declare ahead of time the resources that they will require in that class. Um, also, prevention might be used um, by means of resource ordering within this class. For main memory uh, classes of resources, it might be good to use prevention by preemption um, as, um, as the most appropriate strategy for main memory, because when a process is preempted, it's simply swapped to secondary memory and then freeing space to resolve the deadlock. Finally, for internal resources, prevention is a good way um, um, to handle deadlocks by means of resource ordering that can be used. So you can see here a way, uh, an integrated way of uh, handling deadlocks is to combine the three methods. And then maybe you wanna group resources into a number of different resource classes, and then use the kind of linear ordering that uh, we defined it previously uh, to prevent the circular weight. And even within each resource class, you will determine which algorithm is a better fit to that class. So in conclusion, we were able to see that for swappable space resources, Prevention works efficiently. 
um, for resource uh, process resources, avoidance uh, and prevention can be effectively used. For domain memory, prevention by preemption is a good strategy to uh, handle the blocks. And finally, for internal resources, um, prevention is well recommended. So in summary, we talked about different principles of deadlock, identify different type of resources, including a reusable and consumable resource. We also talked about the resource allocation graph. And finally, the four conditions for deadlocks. We also talked about how you would uh, prevent a deadlock by uh, preventing one of the three conditions of which execution hold and wait or, or no preemption, or if you're going to prevent the circle weight, that's enough. In deadlock avoidance, you have two strategies, either by uh, denying the initiation of processes or by a, um, denial of resource allocation. And we have seen the bankers algorithm for this. For deadlock detection, we talked about the deadlock um, detection algorithm, which is an iterative algorithm to check recursively if there is a deadlock or not by marking or unmarking processes that might cause a deadlock. And we also talked about different recovery for after detecting the deadlock. And in conclusion, we reached that each method is um, like enjoy some advantages and suffer from some disadvantages. And each method is a well suited for each class of um, resources. So it might be a good way to integrate um, multiple strategies uh, into one integrated deadlock strategy to be efficiently um, and effectively uh, able to handle and uh, prevent and detect deadlocks. So this is the end of today's class and I'll see you next week.